how are you doing? My name is Mariam. I am the Senior Access Officer at Lady Margaret Hall, which is a college of the University of Oxford, and I am a former English student, which means that from my own experience of applying, I remember exactly how even just considering the application process at Oxford can feel like you're navigating a bit of a maze, but it really doesn't have to feel like that. And that's why I'm running this webinar today. I am gonna give you tips, I'm gonna show you where you can access resources, I'm gonna give you information which will enable you to make a competitive application to Oxford should you want to, okay? So let's get started, let's talk about that application process. This is just a snapshot at the minute and we will hone into each of these areas and I'll give you more detail as we keep talking. So, first things first, if you decide to apply to any university, you will have to make your application through a website called UCAS. Should you decide to put the University of Oxford down as one of your five choices, you have a further decision to make. So, do you wanna make an open application or do you want to make a first choice college application? I'm just gonna hold here and explain exactly what that means because I personally had no idea what a college was. A college essentially is a home. There are 35 undergraduate colleges that make up the University of Oxford. They're a place where you eat, where you sleep, where you live, where you have access to facilities like the library or a dining hall. Uh, they're a place where you will have some of your core teaching and of course that teaching is determined by the university itself. So the standard, the quality of that teaching across the board, across those colleges is going to be exactly the same. What makes them different then? It's stuff like size, location, facilities, atmosphere. Um, so for me personally, I knew I wanted to go to a place which was a bit more chill, uh, not as traditional, a bit more informal, relaxed. Um, and Lady Margaret Hall ticked that box for me. And I remember looking it up and it had this really cool pioneering history. And I think still is a pioneering college. Um, and also it was five minutes away from the English department uh, where I had to walk to. So, you know, win-win <laughs> for me. I had my priorities right. Um, October the 15th is the date you need to be looking at. This is the date by which you need to submit your UCAS application if you are applying to Oxford. It's important to note that because it's earlier than other universities, which is actually quite nice because it means you can get your application out of the way and then focus on your studies. This is also the date by which you need to register for an admissions test if you're setting one. Now, I applied for Oxford two days before the deadline for a huge number of reasons. One of them being the fact that I didn't think I would fit in and was really worried and actually had nothing to worry about at all. Um, but because I left it so late, I hadn't quite realized I needed to also register for, for a test and also left that very late and did it, I think, on the day. And it was really, really stressful and I wouldn't recommend it. So knowing that you have to do that as early as possible, I think will make things go more smoothly. It's a good way of starting. Late October to early November is when most of those admissions tests will be taking place. Do be sure to check out the website for the most up-to-date and accurate dates. November the 10th is when we have our deadline for submitting written work. December the 4th to 16th is when interviews take place. And finally, early January is when we send out our decisions to candidates. But before you can contemplate any of this, your biggest decision to make is choosing what course you are going to study. And I honestly cannot stress this enough. Guys, when you go to university, you will be studying the same subject in depth for about three to four years. So picking something you genuinely enjoy is a pretty good bet, okay? It's something our tutors actively look for and it's gonna help you stand out when you're applying. And vocational aspirations, yeah, they're important, but they're really not enough to sustain your commitment to a course on their own for that amount of time. And I say this as somebody who comes from a culture where the expectation is that to be successful, you absolutely have to be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. So while my parents were absolutely elated that I was the first person in my family to go to university, there were other people who made remarks about my studying English. So something along the lines of, you know, 
what are you going to do with that? You know, why not become a doctor? To which I was like, huh, thanks. Um, completely not true. There are, you know, are loads of things you can do with a huge variety of subjects. There are so many career prospects available to you as a student. Um, but also I, one, wasn't qualified to be a medic and two, wasn't really interested. Sorry to anybody who's interested in studying medicine here. Uh, to put it bluntly and in truth, you know, if you're going to apply to an oversubscribed subject, purely on the basis that it's going to set you up uh, for a fantastic career and that's not backed by anything by no you know enthusiasm by no genuine interest or motivation the tutors are going to see right through you um it's just not worth doing now this is a really useful link i want to show you and these links i will reference um uh, below this video and you can click on them so don't worry about taking notes uh, it's the courses listing page so it lists all the courses that are available to study at Oxford I am gonna go for the first one that I can see which is archaeology and anthropology and it will tell me all sorts of information including what that course is uh, why it's particularly distinctive at Oxford um, what kind of careers might be available to me if I study it, uh, you know, what the typical weekly timetable might look like, what the structures over those three years of studying that course. Um, but it also gives me loads of other information, so what the requirements are, uh, how to apply, um, and if you have a look, some nifty stuff like this. So this gives me a link to podcasts uh, on this topic. Uh, recorded at the university which is absolutely fantastic and entirely free for you to use so you should use it um, and then if you go to the how to apply page and scroll all the way down it should give you here we go suggested reading so in this instance it will give me a reading list which is I think invaluable um, whether you're thinking of pursuing a subject or whether you know this is what you want to apply to this is a great tool to be able to use um, and this kind of stuff will be available on that page for every subject which is listed so definitely definitely have a look okay so how can you decide what subject it is that you want to study at university well i mean have a think about what it is in school or outside of school that really, really interests you. What doesn't feel like a chore? What would you like to pursue? And once you have decided that, do exactly that, pursue it. And the really easy way of doing so is by reading books around that subject area, uh, watching videos around that subject area, listening to podcasts around that area, etc., etc. We call this super curricular, the idea being what have you done above and beyond your curriculum outside of school to demonstrate your motivation and interest for a subject and i would really recommend making an activity log so list all of the stuff that you've done um, and add a further field where you evaluate those experiences so what did you think of that ted talk that you listened to you know uh, did you agree with what the person was saying? Did you disagree with what they were saying? Did it inspire you to pursue another line of research? You know, just give us something to work with. Um, and that's really, really, really useful for you generally because you can use it pretty much as a dumping ground, as a basis for your personal statement when the time comes to writing it. And let's be honest, nobody really wants to write it. It's a very strange thing to have to sell yourself in however many lines that you are given to sell yourself. But it's also really useful for you and for us. For you, because it gives you a chance to evaluate whether you genuinely are interested in the subject you are writing about. And for us, it allows us to see a bit more uh, you know about you uh, we know more about you as a person but we also hopefully see proof of your commitment to that subject so what is it it's 47 lines 4,000 characters which isn't a huge amount I think that's about two-thirds of one A4 side and with the risk of sounding like a JLS song you only get one shot now what does that mean it means two things it means that all five of the institutions that you apply to will be seeing the exact same personal statement. Therefore, you should focus 
on your course only and not name drop and speak to any of those institutions um, you know you're not going to write a love letter to Sheila and then reference somebody else for half of it it wouldn't make any sense it also means that you should really really be applying to exactly the same subject if not very closely related subjects across those institutions even if they are called different names okay um, because otherwise you're just not going to have a coherent personal statement and that's not ideal at all um, in the case of joint honours where you are thinking of doing more than one subject so let's say you think uh, I'm going to study math at these four institutions but at this institution I'm going to go for math and philosophy um, be sure to give an equal amount of weighting to both of those topics and if it gives you peace of mind and you know our tutors are very aware that you know this is something you might do uh, but feel free to talk about it anyway you know you can reference the fact that you are applying to a variety of single and joint honours uh, in your introduction because um, that will explain why you are also talking about philosophy as well as math now let's have a look at some common pitfalls the first one being using generalizations and cliches for example um, let's say something along the lines of my passion has been history for as long as I can remember. It really doesn't tell us anything. Um, what was it about history which piqued your interest? You know, give us a solid example. Not developing and analysing, so maybe writing uh, a list of things you've done, uh, you know, saying I listen to this podcast and just leaving it at that and not critically engaging with it and telling us what you actually thought about it. Um, will not do anything for us. Overemphasizing when it comes to extracurricular, it's not anything we take into account. We take you purely based on your academic merit um, and that's something I'll uh, develop a little bit later. And finally, whoop, skip that one, uh, use of unnecessary language, for example. While my academic interests focus on the past, I plan to apply the knowledge and experience I gain at university to the present and future you know you have 47 lines and 4,000 characters and you're just wasting them um, if you have redundant floating statements which mean nothing get rid of them what we would much rather have you know is something like this which I think is really effective um, do MPs have any real power will war have an impact on the development of our society it is questions like these which inspired my interest in politics you know you can do that with pretty much any topic two questions um, not that I recommend you copy this in fact disclaimer uh, I'm not suggesting that there is an ideal personal statement this is just a guide and in my opinion I think this is a very very effective opening it's not wasting any time saying anything like you know I was four years old when blah 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 happened and I realized blah 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 it just goes straight into it and immediately engages you with an example of why this person thinks politics is an interesting subject and that's the key there you know it shows doesn't tell why that person is interested in politics um, that's what we're looking for and actually my top tip personally it's something i did in my personal statement and trust me i had really bad parts as well as good parts uh was i ended my first paragraph with a question because i thought it demonstrated um my intellectual curiosity and showed how i was engaging with the topic um and it was also something that the tutors picked up in on the interview and i'd given it some further thought so i did talk about you know what I actually thought in answer to this question so uh, tracing the theme of identity throughout literature particularly infuses me for example does Robert Louis Stevenson's treatment of degeneration in the strange case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde suggest that the self is multifaceted rather than whole and definitive so it is analyzing and it's developing it's not just saying I read the strange case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde um, and that's exactly what you need to be doing providing consistent evidence and examples throughout your personal statement okay let's take a look at the structure we suggest at the university a 80 20 split so 80 percent academic 20 percent extracurricular what do I mean by academic 
uh, well, have a think about these questions. Why do you want to study the course? You know, what are you doing inside of school that might relate to your interests? What are you doing outside of school that might support that? Focusing on that super curricular we were talking about. Uh, what activities have you done? And how do those activities support the course you are applying for and your interest for that course? You may well want to discuss work experience if it is relevant. Um, and only if you evaluate it, just as was the case for supercurricular. So I spoke to a medicine tutor uh, and I remember her saying that she quite often gets people, you know, putting in their application something along the lines of, I shadowed a GP for a week and not elaborate on that. And to her, that then just means I made tea for a GP for a week. And what she much rather would prefer to see is something which says, you know, I um, volunteered at a local hospice for a week and followed the doctor on his or her rounds and realised you need empathy as a doctor, you need stamina as a doctor, relating it to that course criteria which will be listed on the online prospectus wherever possible um, and making it transferable. If you don't have any of this work experience, or, or you know it's not relevant don't worry about it don't put it in you can talk about more super curricular stuff okay um something you should also look at which is quite useful is this page on ucas which gives you advice on writing the personal statement uh and gives you loads of tools to use including a mind map and a worksheet which you can print and fill and actually, this is a really boring exercise, but something you might want to do is print the course requirements of your various institutions and highlight all of the ones that they have in common. And then you can start moulding your statement by talking to those common criteria. Right, so we have discussed personal statements, we have discussed course choice, uh, we're now going to look at transferable skills in that 20% extra curricular. Um, so as I said, this isn't something we take note of. We, you know, take you on academic merit, but other universities do look for it. So definitely give it that 20%. Um, and again, make it transferable wherever possible. So, you know, I do X, Y, and Z, uh, which means I will be able to manage my time well uh, as a student who is doing a demanding degree at your institution. Um, that might be one way uh, to go about it. Okay, let's have a think about those admissions tests. Now, about 90% of our courses have one, so definitely have a look to see whether yours has. The idea is that they stretch and challenge you. They will normally present you with something that you probably haven't encountered at school, uh, but might recognize. Um, they're subject specific, uh, and they're not anything you can revise for, but they are something you can practice for, okay? And that's key. Although you don't wanna overdo it, do as much as makes you feel comfortable. Um, registration is required, and Okay, so when I applied to Oxford, I actually left it till two days before the deadline just because I was not thinking about it at all and thought I wouldn't fit in and, you know, was completely wrong about that and there were loads of other reasons. Um, but because I left it two days before, I hadn't quite read the part where it says you absolutely have to register for this test also by the 15th of October and saw that, I think, on the morning of... Um, <sighs> That was really stressful. Uh, so make sure you have a look at that beforehand and you know prepare in advance and it will make the whole thing less stressful and I just really recommend it. Um, something that you should definitely have a look at is this, the admissions testing website. So let's have a look over here. Uh, I have landed on this page and it gives me test dates it tells me about test centres, so for example, uh, you can sit the test at your school, but your school will need to register itself as a test centre. This link will tell you and whoever is in charge of your application at school exactly how to do that. It will also give you preparation materials, so for test takers, um, 
and I'm obviously going to go for Oxford. Uh, you can choose your test. So I'm going to choose the one I sat, which is the English Literature Admissions Test. It will tell me about the test, what it hopes to uh, achieve, um, what it includes, what the format is like. Uh, it will tell me about uh, the scoring, the typical results, um, that you should never ever compare yourself to other people. <laughs> I think you should always just focus on your own performance, that's the best thing that you can do for yourself. Um, and it will tell you how to register and then give you the resources to prepare. So in this instance, it gives you practice materials, okay? Sample papers, marking criteria, past papers, uh, notes for candidates, examiner comments, etc, etc. I personally um, printed two copies of one test, I think, uh, and went to my English teacher and we sat down and we went through it and that really helped me, though I did a shoddy job in my test and I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, if you don't have anybody at school who you think you know, can go through a test with you, so for example if you're applying to a subject that isn't offered at school, classics let's say, um, please get in touch with me. Uh, you know, I can put you in touch with a student ambassador in that field who will be able to give you tips and help you prepare. Um, and that kind of preparation is entirely free. We want to help wherever possible. So definitely have a look at this link. It's very, very useful. Um, okay. I think that brings us to interviews. Now, interviews for me personally, were the most scariest part of the application process because um, not the process itself but my expectation of what they were going to be. Uh, you know I went to a school where nobody had ever applied to Oxford or Cambridge so we just knew nothing about it and I was going in blind and you know was reading stupid articles which were scaring the life out of me, had me quivering in my hijab, um, you know talking about tutors who will try to trick you and you know questions which were given out of context and I was like how am I going to answer this uh, I had one mock spontaneous interview with somebody um, in school wasn't expecting it was taken into an office and you know was asked what I thought about the political situation in Iraq and I was just like I don't know I just want to study English and then got here and it was nothing like that um, and remember leaving and just being like wow there's so much I wish I'd known beforehand and those are the things I'm hoping to tell you now. So, why do we interview? It's not despite what you think because we're cruel and unusual. It's because actually we learn from an interview much more than we are able to learn from reading a personal statement. So we learn more about you and that helps us to make an informed decision. Also, we design our interviews to replicate the tutorial process, which is the main teaching format at Oxford, okay? So the tutorial is an opportunity for you to sit one-on-one, -on -one, maybe two-on-one -on -one with an expert in a field and to discuss a subject in depth. Often there is no right or wrong and it's just about, you know, bouncing ideas around. So it's seeing whether you are suited to that system. But it's also a chance for you to see us. Do you think you will thrive in this kind of environment with this kind of teaching style? Um, you know, come and find out. It's that's what it is. It's a chance for you to see us as well as for us to see you. Let's talk about the practicalities of the interview. So they usually take place, well no, they always take place in mid-December uh, and you are likely to be invited for about two to three days. You will usually have more than one interview. They will each be 20 to 30 minutes and likely have two tutors in each of them. So for me, I had two. For my first one, uh, I went in and we spoke very much about my personal statement as a starting point and then discussed topics which came up as a result of what I had written in the personal statement. So definitely reread it, okay? And if you say you have read the whole of Ulysses, make sure you've read the whole of Ulysses, otherwise they'll catch you out. My second one, I was given a sonnet and I sat outside and I had 10 minutes to annotate it, then went in and discussed it. So those were mine. Um, and you know the format will be different depending on the subject. Uh, the questions that you are presented with are very much a bit like the test designed to stretch. There's no immediate obvious answer. You know those uh, articles I was telling you about? 
Um, if you read an awful question, it probably isn't awful. And if it comes up in an interview, will very much come up in context. Um, and there will be a tutor there to lead you through a problem and a text and to see how you respond. Uh, that's what happens. And, you know, you can ask for clarification. You can ask to be probed. You can probe them, you know, get them to give you a hint, whatever it might be. Remember, it's based on a tutorial and that's a learning experience. And actually, I think if there's one big tip I will give you here, the one thing I wish I had known was the fact that it was about teachability. It was about your potential and your willingness to learn. Um, I remember being a bit insecure, quite insecure about my place when I first got it and had massive imposter syndrome and just didn't know why I had it. I was like, they've made a mistake. Uh, and there were loads of people buying college hoodies which said, you know, LMH, Oxford. And me and my friends made this pact and kind of said, we're not going to buy one until like the first term is over and we know we've passed the first term. And then I kind of got sick of it and was like, no, enough's enough. I really want one of those hoodies. Um, but was still concerned about this imposter syndrome and feeling like I didn't know enough um, and went to my tutor and kind of discussed this and she said something which will always stay with me which was you know it's not about how much you know it's about what you can do with what you know and you know um, your enthusiasm for a subject and the fact that you came into your interview and were literally on the edge of your seat because you were so excited. You know, it would be no fun teaching somebody who knew everything about everything. That's absolutely impossible. Uh, so if you don't know what's happening, say it. I was told not to, but you know, I did and, and asked for some clarification. And even when I didn't know what was happening, which was quite often, by the way, I would still talk them through my thinking process. Um, and that's exactly what a teaching experience is, you know? Uh, that's something really to keep in mind. Okay, slightly off on a tangent, but there we go. Uh, you might have your interview at more than one college. That's not anything to read into, anything to be frightened by. Um, it's our process of reallocation, which is a system that you can read more about if you just go onto Google and type in reallocation University of Oxford. You'll also have student helpers on hand. You will be given free accommodation and free meals. And actually, I think it can be a quite, quite a nice experience. Um, and you can see it as a positive experience. Like there is a temptation, I'm not gonna lie, to want to cry yourself to sleep when you're approaching that interview, but actually it's an opportunity for you to go to a new city, um, to meet new people and to have a discussion with somebody about something you really, really love. And hopefully they also have that in common. So, you know, seeing it that way, I think can be quite good for your, you know, frame of mind when you're approaching the interview, what it's not. It's not a memory test or a series of yes no questions it's not an opportunity for tutors to trip you up or ask you trick questions <laughs> i was really nervous about this and thought because the tutors were like really impressive people they'd be really really scary um and five minutes or ten minutes into that second interview i was given the sonnet genuinely ran out of steam and had nothing else to say and kind of just said um that's all I've written down. And, you know, the tutor said, that's okay, Mariam, don't worry. You know, uh, what else might you think about? How about this line over there? It gave me a little prompt and I was like, oh, okay, and kept going. Um, and that was really reassuring and you should be reassured, reassured also. Like, they're really not looking to trip you up. They're looking for the good things that you do. Um, so keep that in mind. It's also not, and I can't stress this one enough, an assessment of what you wear, where you come from, or how you speak, because I was quite worried about this. Um, but actually, everybody was really lovely. Like, you know, remember, if you are there, it's because you deserve to be there. And in, in terms of what you wear especially, I wore, I wore some jeans and a top, uh, a smart blouse, I think, with that. Um, and that's all you need to wear something you feel comfortable in you know if that's a suit because it'll put you in the right frame of mind go for it if it's not don't worry about it as long as it's not anything offensive like a Cambridge hoodie 
um, you know, we're just wanting you to wear what you feel comfortable in because that's not what we assess. We assess the way that you think. Uh, two things that I would recommend, actually three things I would recommend having a look at. The first is this video, Oxford Interview Tips, the LMH guide. And also I thought it looked smart, but I know lots of people who didn't wear that. A pinafore dress um, with spotty tights and that made me feel like me. I just wore a shirt that I thought was not too casual and some chinos. The, the honest thing was I did just wear underwear. <laughs> I wore a, a plain black dress. I can't actually remember, which I guess is a good point. It okay, so this is a video where our students and tutors basically just speak to camera and give you loads of tips and explain the process uh, of the interview, you know, what you might expect. Uh, that can be found on the LMH Oxford page on YouTube which you should definitely subscribe to because we have loads of student takeovers and day in the lives of that you can watch for example this one over here uh, okay I know I've been taking the mickey out of them but credit where credit is due this is a fantastic video and obviously they're a fantastic institution <laughs> sorry Cambridge um, Cambridge have a brilliant video on the interview where they get four people who have offers but haven't yet started and get them to recreate the interview process which is nice because you know it's a bit more realistic uh, they're slightly nervous not very polished you know which is what you'd see if you had third year students you know going for mock interviews um, and loads of really 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 useful tips from the tutors and just seeing what it looks like to be in a room talking to a tutor about a subject so definitely have a look at that and then finally have a look at the interviews page on the Oxford website um, and go to sample questions uh, and it gives you a list of not only questions submitted by tutors that they have used in an interview but it's uh, it's teamed with an explanation of what might happen and what they might be expecting so you know somebody might answer it like this uh, I would encourage them to think like this um, you know if they struggle we prompt them to do this so really useful just to have a look at this I think to unpick the tutor's mind and see what's happening there um, definitely definitely have a look at that uh, when the interview is over don't stress you know uh, if you found it challenging that's because it was supposed to be and then chances are that's probably quite a good sign um, but also it's done and you can't change it so you know there's there's no point stressing over it in January is when you will find out how you have done if you've done well congratulations if you haven't quite done uh, you know well and didn't get the place you were hoping for don't worry you'll go somewhere else and have equally an epic time now that brings us to the end of our application process but I just want to wrap up with some takeaway messages the first being that it really is a holistic process okay we have different parts of this application uh, and they really are just one part of a bigger process no one part is more important than the other um, and we look at the bigger picture so I told you I did a shoddy job at my test but you know the tutors would have seen how I performed in my personal statement how I did at my interview and that would have balanced it out um, they would have also seen my contextual data and you can find out more about this on the website but essentially when I sent in my application they would have seen how I performed in my school uh, as a student how my student perform how my school sorry performed against the national average they would have seen that I came uh, from a postcode where not many people for example participate in higher education they would also have seen my teachers reference um, in which my teacher would have referred to some of the mitigating circumstances which might have meant I didn't perform as well as I could have in my educational history um, so if you do have mitigating circumstances be sure to mention them because we take them very seriously uh, finally no question is silly okay I really mean this um, I have a fantastic team of 60 student ambassadors who are really happy to answer any questions about the application process, about their subject, about life at LMH and give you honest answers and I also have an equivalent of me at every college um, who does a similar job to mine, you know, so if you would like to 
get in touch uh, to get some advice or you'd like you know one of us to come into your school and run a workshop that's something we're able to do we really really want to help okay so that's me for now um if you do decide to apply to oxford and i really hope you do and if you're not thinking of it why not you know just go for it you will never know unless you try um if you're thinking of it then i hope it goes well for you good luck to you in whatever it is that you choose to do um, and hopefully, maybe I'll see you here soon. Thanks so much for listening.